Now we are moving to the final lecture of today, and uh, today we have Professor Ji Chuan Xu from Nanyang Technological University. Uh, and Professor Ji Chuan Xu is an associate professor in the School of Material Science and Engineering, Nanyang Technological University. He received his PhD in degree in electroanalytical chemistry in 2008 and bachelor degree in chemistry in 2002 from Lanzhou University, China. He received his PhD training from Lanzhou University Institute of Physics CIS and Brown University since 2007. He worked in State University of New York at New Hampton as a research associate. And from 2009, he worked in MIT as a postdoc researcher. Dr. Xu has received several awards, such as the Johnson Endowment Outstanding Contribution Award, Excellent Scholar in 2018, and the Jiao Wutian Prize for Energy Electrochemistry by International Society of Electrochemistry. Dr. Xu is a member of the International Society of the Electrochemistry, the Electrochemistry Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. He was awarded Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry on November 2017. He served as a guest editor for Electrochemica Acta and Chemistry of European Journal and associate editor for Nano Micro Letters. He's also the development editor for Current Opinion in electrochemistry, and the president of the ECS Singapore section. Dr. Xu is a highly cited researcher by the Clarivate Analytics Web of Science in 2018 and 19. Now, I think Professor Xu is ready to give us his talk about the oxygen electrocatalysis by transition metal, spin now oxide. Welcome. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, all right, I gotta share the screen now. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Firstly, I would uh, uh, I'll express my appreciation to the nanomicro lighters for organizing this event, and also I would like to appreciate everyone in front of screen staying with us. Right, so today I'm gonna introduce, uh, to present the work in our group about oxygen electrocatalysis by the transition metal spin out oxides. So you can see that here, this is a, a quick reach uh, code for our group web page. So I'm from the uh, Nanyang Technological University. Um, our research, okay, uh, the big picture, the background, is about the energy issues. We know that currently we're using the fossil fuels, right? 90% uh, we rely on that. And the problem is limited supply, not sustainable, and global warming. Yeah. And then the urgent mission for us is to develop sustainable and clean energy for the future. For example, we have many choices here, uh, like solar and wind and nuclear and etc. The problem is how we can link this clean energy source to our daily life, for example, smart grid and electrical car. So that causes a need for the energy conversion storage technologies, right? So let's say um, here I list uh, energy technologies for us, uh, info, for our information, for example, the fuel cells, uh, electrolyzers, batteries, capacitors, etc. Right? So all of these techniques actually are not new at all, right? So for example, the fuel cells, it has more than 150 years history, right? But we know that recently, okay, these topics become very hot, right? So this is mainly because all of these techniques really rely on the performance of the materials you use, right? So in recent years, the really uh, rapid development on the materials. For example, we have a, a better way to observe the materials, what happened during the charge discharge, for example, right? So we can have better understandings on the fundamentals. We know how it works. And then we use these principles to design our materials, to make our materials, to engineer, right? So we have better way to make materials we want, right? So a famous example like nano size particle, particle for catalysis, or et cetera, right? 
So today I'm going to talk about oxygen electrocatalysis. So that includes oxygen reduction reaction and oxygen elution reaction. And these two reactions involved in these three techniques, for example, the fuel cells, electrolyzers, and some batteries like the metal ear batteries. So in most cases, we know that we have to use expansive materials like no metals to, to enable this OR and OER. Right? So I'm going to give you two examples. And this is first the example, right? So, and that's the OER reaction in the electrolyzers. So here we demonstrate a simple cell, okay? So we have anode and you have cathode, okay? They can be a water electrolyzer for hydrogen production, or it can be CO2 electrolyzer for CO2 reduction, right? So if this is a hydrogen, okay, if this is a water electrolyzer, you want to produce hydrogen, in your left side anode, you have oxygen evolution reaction. And on your right side, you have, CO, uh, sorry, you have hydrogen evolution reaction over here, right? So we know that based on the Nernst equation, all right, the overall potential applied at both sides actually contribute to the energy loss over here. Right? So you want a lower uh, potential, over potential, as low as possible. Right? So I would like to say, yes, that for the water electrolyzer, the major uh, energy loss happens on the OER part in the anode. So this is very interesting. Although we want hydrogen as our product, but the problem is, at another side, that's oxygen side, right? And if this is a, a CO2 electrolyzer, right, the reaction gonna be uh, uh, more complicated, it depends on the products you have, right? So in this case, you may have the problem not only on the over potential, but also the product selectivity over there, right? But again, if the CO2 reduction happens on, in aqueous media, you still have some kind of a problem in the OER side, the high over potential over here. So let's say state R the electrodes for the OER. So these are some precious metals like uranium oxide and ruthenium oxide. This is very uh, good catalyst in acid media. In alkaline media, we have some oxides, for example, the perovskite oxides like BSCF, etc. And of course, we know that recently BSCF has different mechanism that's lattice oxygen involved mechanism. So activity can be very, very high, right? So basically, our drain place is over here. So uh, this is some dynamic equilibrium potential. You want to apply a little bit over potential, but at the same time, you can achieve a really high okay, reaction kinetics. That's our drain place for uh, OER catalyst, right? But anyway, uh, so far, these catalysts involved some uh, high cost uh, elements. So it, it is a uh, uh, desire to, to looking for electrons by Earth's abandoned elements. Okay, I'll give you a, a second uh, example, okay? So this is a second example. So that's OR in the pan fuel cells. So this diagram is very famous, right? Um, this figure uh, tells us, okay, why the pan fuel cell cannot give you 100% energy converting efficiency, right? So the main problem is the energy loss at the castle side, OR side, right? So let's look at here. So the blue one is, a idea OR, so this 1.23 1, 1 volt, that's a thermodynamics equilibrium of OR and OER over here, right? So above 1.23 volt, that's the OER, below 1.23 uh, volt, that's OR, right, in principle, right? But you can see that um, on the platinum, right, the best catalyst in the element, uh, in the element table, right, best catalyst, the OR, the real OR happens in this red curve. You can see they're pretty much like blue curve uh, left shifted, right? Left shifted. So this shift in the voltage, okay, can be reflected as a power loss, right? So this is energy loss. So this loss actually cannot cannot be avoided, right? Why? Because if you scan the blank CV of platinum in this potential range, right, you will see that in this range, what happened? You have platinum oxidation or uh, OH absorption on the surface. So Platinum surface actually is blocked by oxygen species, and that reaction, can, reaction cannot happen. So until you apply a really high over potential, make platinum reduce, okay, some dynamic at this lower potential, the platinum surface, metallic platinum surface exposed, and then aura can happen. So this is something you cannot avoid it. This is determined by nature of the material, right? But anyway, 
the platinum is still a very uh, uh, expensive, right? We need to look for uh, cheaper materials. But at the same time, of course, you have to sacrifice the activity because so far, uh, platinum is known the best catalyst for the OR, including the platinum alloy uh, catalyst, right? So in this presentation, I'm going to introduce okay, the transition metal spinel oxides. So this is one of focus in our lab. Okay, I'm gonna uh, include uh, three stories. One, first one is a warm-up story about the pseudo capacitance of a spinel ferrets. And then we're gonna talk about OR and OER. And then we will talk about how we can activate lattice oxygen to make a surface reconstruction. So now let's say spinel oxides. So this is spinel oxides. Chemical formula is A, B2, oxygen four, right? So over here, this is a, a cubic spinel unicell. You can see that the oxygen ions packed in the FCC uh, structure. And then you have uh, a metal B and a metal A occupy the octahedral side or tetrahedral side. Right? So you can see here, we can, uh, we can write the chemical formula in detail in this way. right? So we have uh, one parameter called, uh, it, it is lambda between a zero and a one that represents, that, that is inversion degree. Right? That, that can tell us how much A and B occupy in octahedra and how much A and B occupy the tetrahedra. Right? Let's say if lambda equal to zero, that's a normal spin out. All the A occupy tetrahedra and all the B occupy octahedra. If lambda equal to one, that is inverse spin out, all the A and half B will occupy octahedra and another half B will occupy tetrahedra. A famous example that is Fe204. Right, Fe two or four, the Fe two plus occupy octahedral, and then let's say, um, please note, actually for the A side, actually the oxidation oxy, oxidation state can be three plus, not just two plus. In that way, uh, you can write chemical formula like Ab two oxygen four point five, but pay attention on that, the saturation oxygen in this spin out is four, cannot be four point five. So. Yes, we can write in this way. That means we have vacancy of the cation in this uh, structure, right? The famous number is gamma Fe203, right? In this case, both A and B are Fe3+, right? So basically, uh, what we started this research with, um, we synthesized the spinel ferrets, like manganese ferrets, cobalt ferrets, nickel ferrets, and iron ferrets. Iron ferrets is Fe304. We made these spinel oxides, nanoparticles. Look at here, the small uh, black dots, that's nanoparticles. And this bigger, uh, bigger one, a uh, little bit blurry, that's, that's the carbon, it's support, right? So TM tells us these nanoparticles in average like around seven to nine nanometers. And this actually diffraction shows us that's this cubic spinel. And then we put this material onto the electrode and then to study the, just scan the CV to say the capacitance, right? So pretty much you can say the magnus ferret has bigger, biggest loop among these four spinel ferrets. And pretty much that tells magnus ferrets give you highest uh, pseudo capacitance. But of course we have to exclude, we have to exclude contribution from the carbon. We have a double layer contribution, right? We excluded the details you can find in this paper, right? So we, we exclude it and then we plot the specific capacitance over here for these four spinel ferrets. And they are normalized by the mass and also by the surface area of, of these uh, nanoparticles. Let's look at this uh, red one, normalized by surface area, because charge stored on the surface. Indeed, you can see that magnus ferrets give you highest pseudo capacitance. All the others give you almost nothing, right? So the question is why magnus ferrets give you highest capacitance. So we did a very uh, straightforward work. We just uh, do the in situ XES characterizations. Okay, firstly, we look at the zines, do like at the, look at the edge shape, to which can tell us oxidation state, right? So we just uh, look at this summarized figure here, figure H, right? So you can see that in this potential window, when you do the charge and destruct, right? So if you look at this thermodynamics, so the magnets, okay, can increase oxidation state if you increase the potential, but for all the other metals, they cannot, right? So this directly to explain why magnus ferrets has a pseudo capacitance is because the magnus oxidation state changed. They have redox reaction. Of course, they contribute to capacitance, right? But all the other elements, 
they do not change villain state, right? Okay, so this is very straightforward observation, right? Okay, I don't think I don't think that's any science over there, right? Okay, and then we look at the in situ X, yes, XF to look at local chemistry, right? If you have villain state change, right? Of course, you may have at the same time you can observe the coordination number change around your cations, right? So now let's summarize this, okay? Local chemistry, magnus ferrets versus applied voltage, right? Because all the other spin of ferrets does not change. They do not change anything, right? So we only plot, uh, we only summarize magnus ferrets here. So again, I'd like to remind you, magnus ferrets, that's a spinel, right? Spinel oxide. So magnus and iron, they can occupy octahedral and tetrahedral, right? So then we do the fitting, right, of this XF data, and we figure out how much tetrahedral, uh, how much magnus in tetrahedral, how much magnus in octahedral. So that page match is a one to one ratio, right, in the octahedral and tetrahedral. And then we find actually iron has nothing changed. But for magnus, the coordination number changed when you increase the voltage. So this is a consistent, this is consistent with what we have observed in the zines, right? The villains changed. Of course, you have more oxygen surrounded with this cation, right? And then we also find both tetrahedral and octahedral magnus, they can increase the coordination number. That means both increase the valence state and both contribute to the pseudo capacitance, right? So now there is a question. Very interesting question is which geometry may contribute more? Okay. So this is something we want to study, right? So and it it is known that magnus ferrets, okay, if you do magnetic materials, you know that magnus magnus ferrets is very interesting, right? So if magnus two plus, the pretty much they have the same spin structure as iron three plus, right? In that case, the radius contains will determine the occupation. But if magnus is three plus, and then the electronic structure, spin structure, magnus three plus will be different from the iron three plus. In this case, iron three plus will prefer to uh, occupy tetrahedral, right? Why? Because iron three plus is half occupied. I right? have occupied d the orbitals. They have five electrons on the five orbitals, right? And each orbital has one, right? So when you have, when you put this iron three plus in octahedral side, oxygen ligands approach this dxp uh, 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 to uh, uh, 2d orbitals, right? Z square and xy square minus y square, x square minus y square. We have high electrostatic repulsion force, right? It's not stable, right? So we prefer the in the tetrahedral. So we pretty much oxidize magnus ferrites to oxidize magnus from two plus to three plus in average, right? And then we can observe the change in occupation. I will show you in next slides. So we scan the CV again, okay, okay, and then we uh, plot the specific capacitance again for this heat treated magnus ferrites. Of course, we started the occupation of these cations, all right, increase the heat treatment temperature, and more magnets is pushed in the octahedral sites. And then you just correlate figure A and C, you will get this figure D. When you have more magnets in octahedral site, you can observe the higher capacitance over here. So pretty much the conclusion is the magnets in octahedral one contribute more to the supercapacitance. But of course, we cannot exclude the contribution. We cannot say the tetrahedral does not contribute anything, right? Okay, so this is a warm up story. Let's look at the OR and OER over here, right? So this work is about um, uh, from the 2014 or something. At that time, around that time, we know that spina oxide, like magnesium oxide and cobalt oxide, are very popular. We can see a lot of literature that we pulled, they are very high, they're very active for OR and OER. And then we have we have, you know, inspired by our pseudo capacitance work, we began to think, right? We began to think, um, what is the key parameter to determine the activity of spinel oxides for the OR and OER? Can we find out any sign to roughly, at least roughly to tell us the secret, right? So then we, we designed a, a model material, which is cubic spinel magnus cobalt oxides. We choose one magnus and two cobalt. Why we do not choose two magnets? So this is because if you have more magnets, in case magnets is pushed in the octahedral sites, magnets may give you tetrahedral, uh, sorry, may give you distortion to make the spinel not cubic anymore, may become the tetrahedral, right? So when, when you want to study the fundamentals, you want to exclude, right, all the other parameters which may affect 
right? Your observation. You want a simple model as simple as possible. Focus on your right. Focus on your uh, uh, the information key message you want to study, right? So this is why how we design our model material: manganese cobalt oxides, right? So we synthesize the manganese cobalt oxide. We synthesize the six manganese cobalt oxide with different uh, method like solid state chemistry, chemistry reaction, or hydrothermal method, or cold precipitation method. Okay, we use the synthesis temperature to name our samples. Okay, 150 degrees Celsius, 300, 400, etc. Right? Please know that these samples are not one batch sample heat treated at a different temperature. They are six samples synthesized from different muscles. Okay, the synthesis temperature different. All right. And then we loaded this material on the uh, rotating disk to measure the OR and the OER, right? So uh, tutorial, uh, as you know, uh, last year we published a paper on the advanced material with Shao, uh, with Shao Hong, Professor Shao Hong, to introduce how we can uh, measure the OR and OER reliably, right? Okay, so now let's say the further to cloud intrinsic activity, okay? So we, in electrochemistry, we call that specific activity. We need a surface area, right? We need to know the catalyst, the surface area. So we use the BT measure uh, method to plot uh, to get a surface area, and then we are able to uh, plot this tough plots, right? Um, with uh, uh, interesting interesting activity for these six magnesium cobalt oxides. You can see that in this OR, you have the six sample. They have different activity for the OER. That's the same. They have different ac activity. And dash line here represents uranium oxide. In OR, dash line here represents platinum. Okay. So again, you can see that no catalyst better than platinum so far, right? Okay. Um, so now the question is, all of these six samples, they are magnesium cobalt oxides, but why they give you different activity, right? We have already excluded surface area difference, surface area contribution. That means the size, right? Okay. So then what's the reason, right? Okay. So firstly, we look at local chemistry, right? We look at the zines, right? We found, okay, in these six samples, cobalt valence state does not change that much. But for magnesium valence state, that changes a lot, right? But then the, we, we probably want, okay, maybe we can plot a figure to correlate the magnesium valence state with activity to say if we can find any trend over there, right? So because we find the two things are changing, right? And then we also plot, we also started, investigated the uh, uh, occupation because they are because they are spin-offs, right? So they have different occupation for these uh, cations, right? Okay. So now let's look at magnesium valence first, right? So we plot the magnesium valence, okay, versus the activity, right? So left side, this is OR, right? The right side that's OER. The X axis that's magnesium valence, right? So you can see that for these six samples, we can find these scatters over here, right? I have dash line over here represent the volcano part here is a linear relationship right but you may you may not disagree with me because how can you use six data points to plot the volcano plot and the linear relationship okay i would like to tell you that these data points these dash line are not from us this dash line are from the literature okay let's look at or first so for the or this dash line this dash line is from the provost sky Okay, this is from the Professor Shao Hong's paper. He studied uh, magnesium contained or uh, perovskite oxides, and she finds, okay, such a kind of a volcano plot relationship, okay, magnesium valence versus OR activity. And then we find our spinning oxides can fit this data, huh? can fit this volcano plot. So the question is then, the spinner is the same as a perovskite, same or not? So let's look at Powerskai. In Powerskai, for example, let's name magnesium oxide. Magnesium has only one geometry occupation, that is altihedral. Right? So it's known that altihedral is an active site. Right? But for the spinel, new magnesium can occupy is a tetrahedral or altihedral. Right? So then they remind us to revisit, to revisit our uh, XF data over here. This is occupation of magnesium, okay? For these six samples, they have different occupation. And then we did a, a one more correction. We count only, we count the magnesium in althedra as only active site for this uh, OR. And then we are able to, able to correct the data side, the left one, further, right? 
So let's, let's look at this one. So this occupation corrupted the data site. Now you can see that most of the data, data points fit this dash line much better. For example, this 150 degree Celsius one fit much better. This is because 150 degree Celsius has a significant difference in occupation. So now the question is, why we can find this one? Okay, and pretty much concluding the same as Pearl Sky, the uh, octahedral sites should be the active sites. So again, we borrow the slides, or let's say we borrow the idea from the Professor Shao Yang, Shao Hong. Okay, so in octahedral sites, the EG filling matters over here, right? So this roughly is very rough, very rough cor correlation, right? So pretty much you can, you, if you look at the left figure over here, this magnitude valence and this activity, you can find a volcano plot. But how you explain it? You can correlate any two data sites together to find a trend, but these two data sites may not have any relationship scientifically, right? So we want to figure out what is scientific relationship between these two phenomena, let's say the two data sites, right? So now let's look at here. In the octahedral sites, right? For example, for the manganese tree plus, you have what? You have four D electrons, right? And you know that in the bulk, in octahedral coordination, when you have oxygen ions approach this manganese, right? So then this oxygen p orbitals will approach two d orbitals, which is dz square and dx square minus y square, right? So these the orbitals will directly overlap with six oxygen p orbitals because electrostatic repulsion force, the energy of these two d orbitals will increase, right? However, we know that the total d orbitals energy should be keep, remain the same. And then the other three, the other three, the orbitals will lower the energy, right? So the energy gap between these two, we call the splitting energy, crystal field, the splitting energy, right? So if you look at the inorganic chemistry or physical chemistry, you, you, you textbook, you know that, right? So pretty much, and it is interesting for manganese, actually, it is very unique because this uh, electron configuration over here, okay? Electron configuration over here could be electron can be over there or electron can be lower up there. Right. But for the magnets, it's all, always the high spin state, HS, high spin state. What is high spin state? That means electrons always put, okay, prefer the single electron occupy single uh, orbital. And then they do mind the increased energy to jump to higher to the EG, okay? So for the magnets, because the splitting energy is very small, right? Okay, this is because the electrostatic repulsion force is not that strong. So this lower the splitting energy, and then the electron has choice to occupy uh, EG, like, or EG orbitals. So this always, we call this high spin state, right, for manganese. So manganese in oxides is very unique. It always happens in a high spin state, no matter how you vary it uh, within state. So manganese 3 plus, of course, you know that in the EG, you will have one electron. If that's manganese 2 plus, you will give one electron. This electron will not occupy T2G, but occupy this and occupied EG like uh, orbital. If this magnet is four plus, you will take away one electrons and then you will have, have empty EG, right? So this is because magnet is always high speed state. For other elements, for other 3D transition metals, you cannot do this, right? Even from our own, okay, in oxides, the spin state can be different, right? So now let's say, if we know magnet is always high speed state, no matter how you change the valence state, and then we can change the, valence state to the EG electrons over here. All right, see, the X axis changed. This EG electrons and magnets in artificial size. So this figure does not change, right? Okay, but now we can explain it. Okay, EG electrons, we know that if you have more EG electrons, that means the electrostatic repulsion force with oxygen P orbitals will be stronger, and then the absorption with oxygen will be smaller. If you have less EG electrons, the absorption will be stronger, right? So catalysis is you want absorption not too strong, not too weak, right? So that's why you have observed such kind of volcano plot, right? right? So of course you may have a question, this is in the bulk, what about surface? Yeah. So surface again, you can replace this oxygen ions with the OH or OH, whatever intermediates in this OR and OER, right? In OR, right? In that case, maybe because the symmetry of one EG will enhance increased energy, but another EG will maybe lowered, and then one T T2G will be higher because of pi orbitals, right? But again, EG will represent absorption, okay, with oxygen. Or let's say represent interaction with oxygen, P orbitals, even with, uh, of your intermediates. So this plot works on there, right? But roughly, I would say this roughly, okay, explain that. 
So now let's look at OER. For the OER, this linear relationship shape or not, right? It turns out actually these data points are one part of a volcano, right? So again, this volcano is from the polar sky, right? Again, each electrons matters over here, right? So now we have summarized, right? So each electrons in altitude side matters, right? So what about other spin oxides? We also started other 17 uh, spin oxides, okay? We find, all right, so basically, they follow this trend, right? The active metal in alto sites, the EG occupant matters. They can determine or like at least describe the activity of OR and OER. But of course, some data points does not fit that well. For example, the cobalt oxides, etc. So this is because cobalt three parts you already in the box is a low spin state. So we ascri ascribe that a zero EG electrons. But on the surface, but they may have intermediate in, uh, spin state or high spin state on the surface. So, right, it's just different from the magnet. So they may have some EG electron feeling on that, but we cannot use activity to tell the EG occupants, right? Okay. <coughs> so if we look at the tetrahedrocytes, right? So this kind of control experiment, the data analysis, you can say, if you look at tetrahedrocytes, you will not be able to see any pattern over here, right? Okay. So this is some symmetry about uh, octahedrocyte and uh, uh, tetrahedrocyte. Again, we look at a sigma possible sigma bound form here between the oxygen P and uh, uh, DRV2, right? Okay, here is the Z square, right? Okay, follow up this work, we play more, we started more about octahedrocytes. For example, uh, we fixed the tetrahedrocyte with an inert cation zinc, right? And then we look at the magnets cobalt, we put them into the octahedra, and we find they can talk with each other, they can share the electrons, and then they can uh, describe our activity. And also we found the crystal structure, this tetrahedral and the cubic, they have a difference, okay? Although they both are signals, but they may have a different, okay, uh, activity. And also we changed covalency in altihedral sites. Again, we use the zinc to fix the uh, inactive, uh, we use inactive zinc, okay, to fix the tetrahedral site. Uh, does not mean the tetrahedral site is not active, right? Um, and then we started the altihedral site, right? We find that if we have a little bit of iron and a cobalt oxygen covalency can be enhanced, and then the activity can be enhanced. We can find this nice correlation about covalency and activity, right? Okay, finally, I would like to uh, introduce some surface reconstruction work, right? So actually, the spinel is very different from the pearl sky. Right? Spinel is not that in, not that easy to reconstruct or give you a remarkable reconstruction. So can we activate it? Right, That's, that could be a question. So this work we uh, uh, published uh, uh, last year, earlier last last year. How can we activate surface re 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 uh, reconstruction of spinel oxides? So we uh, start, we use zinc cobalt oxide, and then we replace cobalt gradually by the zinc, uh, by the nickel. Right? So we found actually at a higher amount of the nickel, we cannot make these materials. Okay, we repeat many times, but cannot do. Right? And then we did a DFT calculation, we found that in fact, okay, somewhat dynamically, right? When you have more nickel, you cannot get this pure spinal phase. So this is because what? Look at here, that when you have a higher nickel amount, the oxygen P orbital will be higher than the metal D orbitals, much higher, right? So that means what? Oxide not stable anymore, right? Oxygen ions will re return the electron back to metal cations. So of course, uh, uh, oxide cannot be stable, right? But at some sense, right, that gap is not that high, not that big, you are still able to make these materials, make these spinels, a uh, pure phase, but they are believed as a metal stable, okay? A metal stable, stable spinel in some dynamics, right? So this is a, a formation energy calculator inconsistent with the DFT, right? So this is similar to the, to the, uh, to the lithium ion battery cathode. If some of you uh, uh, are in this field, you know that uh, for lithium ion battery cathode material, when you have a nickel, you will activate it you will activate oxygen ions to give you extra capacitance. Why? But you cannot have too much nickel. Why? It's, it's just exactly the same as here. Right? Okay, so because such a kind of transition, right, we are able to make stable spinel and then make a metal stable spinel. We find metal, spin, metal stable spinel can give you surface reconstruction, okay, can allow lattice oxygen participated 
mechanism, right? So this is because oxygen p-orbitals close to the Fermi level, right? Can be and it is activated, right? So the details you can find in our paper, right? And then I will uh, give you one more example how we activate surface re reconstruction. But this is involved a tetrahedrocyte. So I think every uh, maybe most of you know that cobalt aluminum oxide that's kind of act, spin oxide can be active, but cobalt must involve tetra uh, sorry cobalt must involve the reconstruction right to form cobalt oxyhydroxide on surface. But even though after reconstruction, the cobalt aluminum oxide activity is still lower than the zinc cobalt oxide, right? So this reported by many literatures, right? Okay. So, but of course that depends on the synthesis mass, right? So we replace some alumina by the ion, and then we found that actually we can activate the cobalt in tetrahedrocyte, the cobalt for the reconstruction, right? And this here, there's some details in electrochemistry, you can find it. We have a small amount of ion right, replacement over here. For the first the scan, you will see a very significant at earlier, right? When you do an anodic scan, you will see the oxidation peg over here, right earlier. So this is a cobalt two plus, oxidized three plus. But when you come back, you will not be able to see this reduction peak because this is not a reversible process. It's irreversible. Cobalt oxidized to the three plus and give you a cobalt oxyhydroxide on the surface. Right. So now you can see that this reconstruction, but cobalt aluminum oxide, you can see that reconstruction have a little bit light, right? But not that active. In addition, such a reconstruction at early potential can act, can generate activated oxygen ligands over here, right? Which give you higher activity, right? So again, details you can find in our paper, right? Okay. And one more thing is like we find it can be uh, the surface rec reconstruction can be terminated by alumina leaching. So this is because after surface rec reconstruction, uh, a partial leaching of alumina, alumina at interface spinel and oxyhydroxide uh, give you a spinel alumina uh, with, with alumina defect intermediate, uh, uh, sorry, interface over here, which you can find it the oxygen orbitals, two orbitals lowered far away from the Fermi level, that says, okay, the oxygen, uh, lattice oxygen deactivated. So the termination of surface rec reconstruction happened, right? Um, okay, um, I, I probably will scan this, uh, but I highly recommend if you're interested, please read this paper. I think it is very, very interesting about Spain. Uh, we will have more papers uh, and the review um, Including research paper and the perspective about a spin electro electrochemistry. Okay. Um, finally, I would like to summarize. Uh, we systematic ways to study the spin oxides. If you go to our web page, you can find more papers about spin out. Uh, um, uh, acknowledge uh, the contribution from our group members and also our collaborators, and also support from the funding. And uh, 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 finally, I would like to uh, thank you everyone in front of the screen. Uh, for our, our uh, presentation, I really appreciate. It. And also, I, I will highlight a few papers I published on the Nan Michael Letters. I'm a social editor, but uh, I would say uh, I would like to share some experience with you as uh, readers and the authors. I think as authors for this uh, uh, journal, and I think it's fantastic, right? I would like to highly recommend this paper by my colleague uh, Feng Zhen Xing in the Oregon State University. He's an expert by, by the uh, uh, X-ray absorption spectral microscopy. He's trained by this, educated by this. He's not a user, he's a beam scientist, right? So this is very, very good tutorial in, the, in our nano micro lighters. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye, uh, finished, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Professor Xu. And now we have prepared some questions. Uh, I think you have made a very solid presentation on the, the fundamentals to the real uh, correlate with the correlation to the uh, activities. So now, first, I have a question. Uh, yeah, the, because I noticed that there is a, um, uh, some data with the sample treated at different temperatures from 150 to something like eight or 900 degrees. I noticed that there is a, uh, the 150 sample is on the right side of the peak, while the some samples, uh, 300 samples is on the left side of the volcano peaks. So I was I'm wondering why you didn't jump jump over the 150 and 300. Why don't you choose something between them so they can approach the peak? 
Ah, okay. Um, I, I would say this is a very good question, but, but it really depends on the way of thinking, right? So pretty much here, we do not correlate the temperature, right? We do not correlate the temperature of synthesis temperature with our activity, right? So in this case, I think there's no need to uh, look at the, three uh, the, 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 for example, the temperature between 300 and 150 degrees Celsius, right? And we correlate the magnetic valence, right? But of course, if we choose 200 or 250 something, and of course, maybe we can find, okay, uh, another valence that may, may not have any, uh, it may not consistent with the synthesis temperature, right? So. Uh, yes, absol absolutely. That will in, uh, that will contribute to more data side, but the correlation, uh, I, I will say that will affect correlation. And again, we are not correlating the temperature with our activity. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the second question is about the the, the surface site because uh, usually when we talk about the surface absorption, reaction, and desorption, we we know that usually the step side, the king side, is more active than the surface site. So will there be any like step site or king site that dominate the, the final result rather than because you mentioned that you calculate the bark, you calculate the surface the fi uh, with the surface with one oxygen replaced by hydroxy. And this is, uh, again, this is a very, uh, very good question. So basically, uh, I would say for oxides, we don't start it this much. I think this deserves some good uh, future research, right? This is a very good question. So of course, for these particles, unless we use a very nice single crystal surface, right? We can conclude that. But if we, if we have uh, particles, definitely the surface steps and quirks that will they may have some effect all over there, absolutely. But I cannot comment because we didn't do that. But I can comment something with ex uh, with some uh, established research, for example, metallic surface, right? So yeah. this is no for metallic for the platinum or etc. and even the copper, etc. They have a catalysis, right? But I would say actually the surface steps or less quirks, they may be active or may not, right? Mm -hmm. Compared mm -hmm. with an nice surface. So th this is really depends on the catalysis system and also the catalyst we're involved, right? For example, for example, platinum, right? So for the platinum, uh, we know that if you, okay, if you look at the OR, oxygen reduction reaction, mm -hmm. okay? For oxygen reduction reaction, we know that, okay? If I go back to the slides over here, um, um, okay, if, Okay, if you look at slides here, okay, so you know that this energy loss for ORs on platinum is mainly caused by surface oxidation, or let's say the surface absorbed oxy oxygen uh, species like OH, etc. Right. So now think about it. If my platinum surface is a reach of steps or curves, that's more platinum and the coordinated, right? At the corner mm -hmm. of the platinum, etc. So that means platinum is more active, more active to what? More active to oxygen species absorption. Let's say the OH oxidation. In this case, that will make the platinum OR activity worse. So oh, that yeah. means that it, it won't work. However, no, no yes, however, if we look at the mass no oxidation, Alcohol oxidation, for example, yeah. methanol oxidation or carbon monoxide oxidation, again on the platinum, we know that OH is a key intermediate to finish this CO, right? To make a CO oxidized to the CO2, right? The methanol oxidation, you have an intermediate, which is carbon monoxide CO absorbed. So in that case, if surface has more steps, corners, or curves, or, and the coordinated platinum, actually you can promote methanol oxidation reaction. Okay. Yeah, so I again, I would say my perspective is like for oxides, maybe we can find a similar thing. Depends on a different catalytic system. Maybe different, some oxides have more steps will contribute more, or some uh, reaction, more steps will make the activity worse. Yeah, I think that's very insightful and helpful. And uh, probably someone will follow your idea today to get some new results. Yeah. Thanks. So Thank you. Time limitation. Uh, we, we, we probably do have to stop here and thank Professor Xu again for his talk today and his answering. And uh, uh, we are moving to the final part of today's uh, conference. So, uh, Professor Xu, you can uh, drop out of the sharing, and we are giving a final. Uh, 
Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Good yeah. day. So uh, I think we have a pretty successful webinar today by the cooperation between the research cloud and nanomicro ladders. And uh, for, for more news and uh, progress and any activities in the future, you can uh, scan the, the QR code here for the nanomicro ladders and uh, also for more activities or uh, lectures given in the coming days. You are welcome to join our WeChat groups for the research cloud, and any of this will do the job. And uh, probably in, in the future, we will have some activities for the award selection by taking uh, joining the activities we hosted. And thank you uh, today for joining us. And uh, at the end, we are having Dr. Bo Chen to give us the final closing remark of today's webinar. Please welcome Dr. Borchen. Yes. OK, uh, so everyone can hear me, right? Yep. Uh, OK, thanks, Professor Shi Hu. Uh, today is my honor to give this uh, closing remarks. So I come back with different background. Just now people ask uh, that, uh, are you come from Professor Lo Xiongwen's group? No, I'm from Professor Zhang Hua's group. Don't uh, take a mistake. So uh, I, here I would like to thank five leading scientists, Professor Zhongling Wang, Professor Li, Professor Ho, Professor Zhang, and Professor Xu. And uh, I also would like to thank Professor Shi Hu as a host and the research cloud and the Yuan shared as support for this webinar. I would like to thank all of you. Uh, so I would like to say, uh, Editor-in-Chief Professor Ya Fei Zhang, all our distinguished speakers, all our, all of our friends, audience, and, and the followers, uh, you are welcome to submit your paper to MML. If you have any problem, you can contact us. Uh, well, any kind of method. And you can also uh, sc uh, scan the QR code. Welcome to joining us as a member, as an author, as a research, as an editorial member of our journal. Finally, I would like to thank all of you in the time of COVID-19, be united, be the light. Thank you all. all. Well, we have closed all of our session. And uh, for other uh, notice uh, announcement, we will uh, write in the following report and the following WeChat 推文谢谢所有的观众我们这本次的活动到此结束感谢大家的支持大家可以如果可以的话请在一站在各个平台打击六六六嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯